Sego, Bonzu, Ani. My name is Matthew Green. I'm the very proud MP right here in Hamilton Center. I am coming to you from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron Wendat. And like many politicians before me, I have recited a land acknowledgement in the spirit of reconciliation. And today I want to talk to you about what a real land acknowledgement is. Today marks 100 days that the Haudenosaunee land defenders began their peaceful occupation and use of their territory that was slated for unwanted development. Yesterday, October 25th, marked the anniversary of the 1784 Haldeman Track Proclamation, where the Crown promised six miles on either side of the Grand River to the Haudenosaunee. So for over the last 236 years since this promise was made, settlers have encroached and developed on these lands. The Haudenosaunee have been resisting this unwanted development for years, and today they're still saying no to development done on their lands without their free, prior, and informed consent. Across Canada, Indigenous land defenders face police violence, discrimination in the justice system, and a suppression of their inherent rights. Haudenosaunee land defenders at 1492 Landback Lane are facing an, inj an injunction that made permanent by the Ontario Superior Court. This injunction is claiming damages of $20 million from Skylar Williams, the alleged spokesperson for this site. There have also been 33 land defenders and allies who have been arrested and they need criminal defense funds. The land defenders are appealing this decision, but fighting in the courts is an incredibly expensive process and it's not a burden this community should have to face alone. That's why today I am personally pledging $1,492 to the 1492 Landback Lane GoFundMe account and I challenge others to do the same, to donate in multiples of $1,492 whatever you can. If it's just $14.92 or $149.20 or $14.92 or $14,920,000 to take the burden of the $20 million injunction off of this community. Now is the time to make a donation to the $14.92 Land Back Legal Defense Fund on GoFundMe. We are all treaty people. And as settlers of this land, we have an obligation to uphold our treaty commitments. This means doing our part to push back against the systemic oppression, displacement and erasures that indigenous people face. It means giving up privileges that we gain at the expense of indigenous people. The land defenders at 1492 Land Back estimate that they'll need half a million dollars for their criminal defense. So you can see that they've already begun um, but they're not all the way there. So today, I'm asking you to help them get to their goal. Chimigwich, Nyawe. And the Bill of Rights is what you called it. And our instruction has always been about responsibility. So it should have been a Bill of Responsibility. If it was a Bill of Responsibility, I think we'd be in better shape today than a Bill of Rights. So we have to think about that. 
And when the peacemaker said, seven generations, that's an instruction of accountability and responsibility. Seven generations, don't think about yourself. But what we're saying at that time was to be unified and to work collectively for the good of the people, for the good of the commons. And somehow or that's been perverted into individual. Somehow or other the commons succumb to the individual rights, and that's not right, and that don't work. And the result of it is what we see right now. And to learn you have to have teachers. And who's your teacher and the teachers? Nature, the earth. You learn, you learn, and you learn how to get along, you learn how to be respectful. And so, from what I see and from what I know, and my travels, is uh, the indigenous people have have about the best understanding of this, and I would say. That's probably the biggest loss that I see in humanity now is this loss of understanding of relationship. They don't understand their relationship. How do you maintain this relationship? How do you uh, polish it? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it uh, shiny? Uh, how, do you, how do you work with it? How do you enjoy that? Well, uh, our, our people have done that through ceremonies. We do these ceremonies. We have developed these very elaborate thanksgivings that requires a community to do that. And it requires everybody to be part of it. And it's a lot of work. And we have a big thanksgiving. And how do we do that? We make songs and we make dances and, and we make speeches. So the ceremony is for everybody. You don't have to be there. You just be grateful that it's going on, that we're keeping it up. That's what's important, that it, it takes place. And sometimes you can be there and most of the time you can't, but be grateful that somebody's looking after that spiritual side of things. That's what's the real world, actually. The spiritual side of it, you can't see but it's probably the most real of all. So we have to bring the rest of the world into that context. They have to understand their relationship and their responsibilities. The statement that's most important here is to understand how closely we're related to the earth and that we're part of the earth and we're part of nature. Nature is, uh, is us, basically, you know, and they always talk about environment, something like it's over there or it's a category or something. No, we're, we're it, we're in the middle of it, we're part of it, and uh, we affect it, and we survive in it, and we are part of the earth. Now, if people understand that, that would be very helpful because they'd be more careful about things. And so um, the question, of, um, of recognizing uh, where we are and who we are and why we call the earth our mother, it's simple because you have respect. Everybody respects the mother. And so when we personify uh, the sun, our eldest brother, or the thunder, lightning we call our grandfathers or the winds we call our grandfathers. It's a personification that can draw you closer. That's what it's all about.
we always, I think we always wondered why, uh, why did they think it was uh, right or just to, to do what, what they did was, uh, you know, to, to take our lands and to push us off our lands and, to, and try to eliminate us as a people. And then we discovered this doctrine of discovery, and it was it just kind of made things uh, understandable as to <clears throat> where they where they got their direction from. When Columbus landed, and he went back, and he reported, and they said then, they the leaders, and the Vatican was the most powerful voice in the world at that time. A papal bull, 1493, one year later. If there are no Christian nations in this new land you have discovered, I declare those lands to be empty. Terra nullius, very old Roman law that had been exercised in Africa India, Europe. Further, if there are people there and they are not Christians, they do not have a right of title to land. They have only the right of occupancy. From our perspective, the same right as a rabbit running on the ground or a turkey or a deer or a buffalo or an Indian. They do not have a right of title to land. 1823, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall adjudicating the case, Johnson versus McIntosh. Two white men arguing over Ohio Indian land. He says, you boys have it all wrong. Don't you understand? This was settled long ago. They don't have a right of title to land. And he moved that principle into U.S. federal law, 1823. The doctrine of discovery became the doctrine of law today. Christian doctrine, specific. It wasn't Muslim doctrine wasn't Jewish doctrine, Christian. And it prevails. It's here, it's a reality, but most people don't understand that, and most people don't know that. We didn't even understand that on 1990, 1991, when I first really said, wow, what's, what's, what's the doctrine of discovery? What is that? A young man by his name was Steve Newcomb said, I got something, you guys gotta see it. Came out of Peru. Came out of people down there that were really digging. It was a unspoken conspiracy by states. Going on all those years. Shh, don't tell the Indians. We found out anyway, eventually, finally. 2007, Oneida versus New York. Court case. First notation by a Supreme Court Justice Doctrine of Discovery. 2007, it's not alive. I think it's alive and well. 30 year court case for Onondaga Nation, dismissed out of hand. Oh, you guys were too slow, it's too late. Uh, let's make up, uh, let's see, new latches, we'll call it. Besides, it's disruptive to our people. That's what the justice said, it's disruptive. No discussion about our people and about justice and about what's right. 
The American people don't know about this. Well, it's time they learn. It's time they learn because it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us. And I would be very, very, very careful about stamping out the last place that's holding the line the hardest. Hodino Shoni said to nation, that's holding the line the hardest for the common good, for the good of all, for the future. That's what I have to say. possible to ride for days and weeks and subsist off of the land. Now the people attempt to do these things and there's the tears because it really can't be done like that anymore. No tears. But there's the dream of the time before when those things were done with no tears. We know the purpose of this journey. Once again, we must unite. Our collective minds and hearts hereby declare the following. Living treaties make healthy nations. Historical treaties must be recognized and interpreted from our perspective. Indigenous leaders who hold traditional values, beliefs, and cultures must be recognized and respected as leaders in their own right and by the world. First environments last. Environmental assessments must include the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples. Mother Earth and everything she holds, including water, plants, and animals, must be acknowledged and protected. Senyut <laughs> 
We call ourselves Hodinoshoni. That means we build house. Um, the reason why is because this is like a house right here. And it goes, it continues on. This white path continues on. The path continues on because our job was to promote that. So the path that continues on, our job is to promote that peace. We call it Gendang Shra, that's like benevolence. And the Ga'anikwiyo means, that means a good mind. There's a good minded way of resolving any issue. And Ganuh Kwashra, that's one of the laws that we have um, to have a care for each other, to, to really care for one another. These values that come from our Creator form the basis of our law uh, that's known in English as Great Law. Uh, in our language we say Ganyan Shra Gowa. It really means like a real good thing that will bind us. And all of the nations, our ancestors bought into that and it brought them together underneath this tree. And that's what the belt shows as well as this, this tree is a symbol in the center. And it's a symbol of peace. All of the people will be sheltered underneath the branches of that tree of peace. And every time that we spread that feeling to another people, that branches grows a little bigger and the tree gets a little taller. And, and our cane here records, basically that's, that's all the different families. The Mohawks, uh, the different clans, you got the turtle, wolf and bear, and the Oneidas and the Anadagas, the Cayugas and the Senecas. All of these were different families. The, uh, they were like main families back then. In the early goings of the world, um, our uncle, challenged our creator because he wanted to dominate with bad things into this world. So they agreed on contests. We'll have a contest. And they, they agreed on something called the stick ball game. The ultimate rule was you cannot touch the ball with your hand. Anything else, yes, but you can't touch the ball with your hand. And so that ultimate rule also is in well ingrained lacrosse today. That's the ultimate rule. You can't touch the ball with your hand. That's where everything started. In this instance, um, they played for six days and it was a stalemate. And our uncle being, well, of a bad mind, he just said in his mind, well, I'm done playing games. And he grabbed the spear and he lunged at our creator just trying to eliminate him, just trying to kill him. And our, our creator avoided that. And in the same instance, he grabbed a deer's antler and he subdued our uncle with a deer's antler. And so this is why, again, the horns of authority, which you see in um, the bonnets of our leading uh, chiefs, it's in there, so you can recognize instantly on who is a hereditary chief and who isn't. They'll have the horns of authority within their bonnet. Historically and constitutionally, uh, we are to come to consensus for the sake of peace. We, we put clan mothers in place, we put chiefs in place. It's a really intricate system of checks and balances based on family values. And that is where the consensus is put on, are those chiefs. When they come into council, Nothing uh, becomes a law until they all agree, and it could take a long time, it could go on for days. This is the, um, it's called the women's nomination belt. And this is what was given to, uh, to the clan mothers um, when it acknowledged the, the role of the, uh, of the women in the Confederacy and the relationship uh, to the land. The peacemaker, he said these roots that extend to the west, to the north, to the east, and to the south will be known as the White Roots of Peace. And many nations will recognize its purpose. It was the duty of the Cayuga Nation to formally adopt other nations when they come here following the Four Roots of Peace. So the Tuscaroras were adopted as a nation 
So that made it six nations. But other nations came not as a whole nation, like Delaware and Tudelos were all adopted here. The peacemaker told the leaders there will be a people arriving from one of the directions. And when they see this route, they will not understand it. And when this happens, the tree will weaken, and it will start to fall, and it will land on the arms of the leaders. When the Europeans first came over here, they, were, they came over here looking for riches, looking for land, looking for freedom. They found that here. They found that here, but they didn't realize or didn't want to realize there's other people here already. So they began encroaching on our lands. And it came to the point where they, they went to war with us. Well, the first ones were the Dutch, and uh, we defeated them. And it, after that, it came to the point they came to us, and they wanted to be friends. And we had no thoughts of dominating them. We recognized that by that point that their ways were so different than ours that we had to have some sort of process where we could talk to them formally and make an agreement with them. In the beginning, there was a rope that they joined to one another's arm symbolically, and they said if there's trouble over here with the Ongwahongwe, then he can shake his arm and they'll feel it on this end and we'll assist one another. And if it happens that these non-native people are in trouble, they can shake their arm and we'll feel it over here and we'll, in this way we'll work together to find a resolution to any problem that we, that we have. So that became the basis of the first international agreement we made and it's called the Covenant Chain. And it's referred to in English basically as having three links, peace, respect and friendship. <laughs> And after the Dutch, probably about one lifespan later, the English outnumbered them and they, and they took it over and they said, we think that agreement is good that you made with the Dutch. We'd like also to make the agreement. So our ancestors made the same agreement with the English as well. And that's when it became an iron chain. And at some point later on after that, they said, we'll make that iron silver now because iron can rust. If we make it a silver chain between us, that, that'll that never rust. We'll just have to keep it clean from time to time. And that means to resolve issues. So this is our method right here. This is our method of resolving issues between the Ongwahongwe and the government of the non-natives. So we have that relationship. 
So <clears throat> because during the American Revolution, uh, most of us, I, I dare say, uh, end up being allied, and the, the Mohawks were the first to follow. It was under the leadership of Joseph Brandt. We actually disobeyed the direction from the Confederacy Council because, like I said, we stand for peace. At the same token, you have to realize the circumstances we put in. Our peoples were being attacked. Land was being stolen. We were being lied to, and uh, we needed uh, some alliance. The women actually refer to uh, George Washington in our language uh, as Ronada Gairus, and it means the village destroyer. Essentially, they burned out all of our villages, burned our crops, and uh, our people basically had to flee the, the, uh, our, our original territory in upstate New York. So we had to come over here with the uh, British loyalists. Frederick Holland was Governor General and Commander-in-Chief of His Majesty's forces, the English forces. And before he could get our allegiance, Grant had made him pledge that if we had lost any of our land, to make good for any of our losses, that the Crown would do that. And so for 12 years, we waited for that to happen, and along came the Haldeman Proclamation. We stand by the 1784 treaty, and uh, those lands are ours. Should be close to a million acres, and today we have less than 5% of that. No doubts that, that if we had not allied ourselves with the British Crown, you would be standing in the United States of America right now. Um, not just during the American Revolution, but again in the War of 1812. You'll often hear it said that our position here geographically at Grand River was strategically done as a buffer zone between the British and the Americans, so we were in between them. So in other words, the Americans would have to attack us before they could get Canada. So I know they hold General Brock up to be such a hero, but in reality he was dead within the first, first hour of battle. It was the Six Nations Grand River men, the Aguasasne Mohawks, the Gunasadage and Gunawage Mohawks that saved Canada from becoming the United States of America, 51st state. In 1796, Joseph Brandt received the power of attorney from the, the Confederacy chiefs for a long-term mortgage for 302,000 acres in the northern portion of the, the Haldeman Track. And that was to be mortgaged for 999 years. The investment from that land would, in fact, take care of all of our wants and needs on Six Nations. The Crown took on itself at that time to be the agent of trust for us. A lot of that money never found its way to the trust accounts. A lot of that money was taken from the trust accounts by the Crown itself to build the infrastructure of Canada, such as the McGill University. Bank of Upper Canada, which today is the Bank of Montreal. A lot of it went into the overall debt of the province, transferred right to run the country. One idea they had was this, how to make the Grand River navigable. So the Grand River Navigation Company was started. They built a dam, had legislation empowered to dam the Grand River, stop the, the passage of fish. They flooded 2,600 acres of our land without uh, compensation for the land itself. And they invested a lot of our money in, into that, and then it went bankrupt, and they would never paid us back. Montreal Turnpike. Upper Law Society of Canada, if you go there today in Toronto, you'll see a plaque that, that admits that. Uh, we've never gotten that money back. I mean, we actually I mean, we owe it in Osgood Hall. Six Nations would not surrender any more land, so they would only lease. Title to the property would never leave Six Nations' ownership. We have roughly 19,000 acres that were specifically laid out in areas to be leased. Johnson Settlement upside in the northern part of Brantford. Uh, Eagle's Nest right, track right in Brantford. Martin's track uh, in Onondaga Township. Oxbow Bend, just as you come out of Brantford. We've got the Hamilton Port Dover Plank Road, which we know today is the Caledonia site. It's a small part of the Caledonia site is on that road. Now these were specific areas for leasing because they would not sell it. However, the Crown, through their actions, sold the land, and I guess that's where they got caught. Our research caught them, is basically what it boils down to. Well, back in 1923, the Canadian government got some people down here to form a little group, and they thought they'd make it into an elective system. And now it was imposed by the RCMP when they raided the council house where the chiefs were meeting. And the chiefs knew that they were going to come, so they hit out some of the, some of the wampum belts. But even so, there was still some there that the, the RCMP took. That there disrupted our process quite a bit. What they done at Six Nations had nothing to do with democracy. That was about covering up an investigation into our funds. What I understand is that there was an issue of where our monies were going. We had made a trusteeship with the Crown to oversee and manage 
this this rent payments and and mortgage payments coming in there was a dispute in there because our ancestors knew there were unauthorized expenditures coming out of our national treasury see our ancestors they tried their best to apply these these laws and rules that were made between us and the crown and they found that it stopped being the law of the land for the crown so they said well look over here and they sent this guy he with the help of an international lawyer they sent him overseas first he went to try to get justice right from england from the king um they wouldn't even hear him then he went on to the league of nations tried to get an application in there because they said you had to be a member nation so he applied on behalf of six nations to join the league of nations and, and he was denied at every turn this story comes straight from the sky one of the chiefs of the kyugas i am the speaker of the council of the six nations the oldest league of nations now existing it was founded by hiawatha it is a league which is still alive and intends as best it can they defend the rights of the Iroquois to live under their own laws in their own little countries now left to them to worship their great spirit in their own way and enjoy the rights which are surely theirs as the white man's rights are his own what they done they wouldn't allow him to cross back into Canada uh he travel on a passport issued by our government and he ended up living in Tuscarora he wasn't able to come back return back home here until he died that's only when they allowed him come back in their in a in a coffin so they stopped letting his wife and children visit him and i'll tell you something his wife and children as soon as they could they moved away from canada it, it's a it's it's really hard pill to swallow that we have not received an apology to this day by the government of canada for the treatment of that leader and voice of our people Well, when we took a stand back in 1959, we took over the council house because we were sick of the way Van Council was treating us. The council took a look at at all the people, and they didn't want any part of it, so they went out the back door of the Six Nation Council. The Confederacy had built that old council house, so Colbin and Paulus and myself took. Uh, we took the pins out of the doors in front of all these people and one RCMP officer telling us you can't do this then they wanted to go to the community hall they wanted to dance so we went over there and we did the same thing we pulled the pins out we didn't wreck the door didn't smash nothing just pulled the door pins out and and opened the doors and they went in if i had any doubts when we got in the community hall the old timers the indians they were six abreast around that community hall dancing what a beautiful sight i still remember and i became an ip and uh, we went around to catch anybody that was say the drinking or breaking in or something like that that they gave us the power to do that from the confederacy it was something we felt like we we are looking after our own community which in a matter of speaking we were they were told that they had a deal all they were going to wait for was the government to come and sign this deal turn power back over to the confederacy didn't happen that we as a matter of fact 10 to 3 in the morning is when the mounties came in they came in like this they were using those billy clubs on the backs of the people I never heard such an awful sound in all my life as that thud sound of them hitting the people women too well two of my aunts were there and they were both pregnant both of them got beat up i know one of them had a concussion one of my sisters was alive then they got a couple boots to the side of the head i was the most arrested <laughs> man of all of them, all of them i was uh, kidnapping they had me for and imitating a police officer was cuz they had the ip band on breaking and entering was for the two doors that we pulled the pins out in front of all the people we never even went in so it wasn't entering the people went in so i was in jail over the weekend anyway and 
the lawyer come in and he said they they said that if you promise them you won't do it again then that's as far as it'll go <laughs> When the Lubukam came to visit us, they, there were people who have only had contact with the outside since about 1935. And in those sh few short years, they went through what we went through in hundreds of years. Um, so it was, just, it was really important that we try to help them. The reason why we went out west is to, to cement the friendship with them people out west. Even though they're different at, and different nationality, you might say, different tribes, but it was to bring them together under one roof. And uh, we had a lot of talks about where we could, how we could help each other, support each other morally and spiritually. We went out there to, to support them with our beliefs and our ceremonies, and it helped them immensely. Things happening in nature to, to change the course of events immediately. I think, I think back at that time, the Alliance, which we call the Alliance, was relearning the Creator's gift to us. That's one thing that, that I think we still hang on to, and albeit by a thread, I feel, on Six Nations, is we still have that belief in the Creator. I think that if we all stood together and fought and be strong, we could have it all. And I used to lose, and I still lose, lose hope sometimes, but I remember something like my clan mother used to say to who's my mother. She said, I always remember nothing's ever lost. I'm here upholding the law. We're here upholding the Gairalagoa. Our responsibilities with respect to that, um, defending our land and our rights. Who started this? The reality of it is, it was set in motion long before any of us in this room were ever born. You know, this struggle has been going on for um, for centuries, and it was just a matter of who was going to actually step up and take action. We do need a place for our future children and grandchildren that we have. We need a place for them to 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 live. And to own. That land up there in Caledonia was illegally bought and illegally sold by the province, I guess, that sold that land. They had no right to do that. And all we're doing in our observation is just trying to get back our territorial right. Because that is our land base. That is our future. People were concerned about seeing this new subdivision uh, coming in uh, right next to where we live. In the end, two women had approached the uh, Confederacy Council, and it was Don Smith and um, Jamie Jamison, and had asked us for permission to um, hand out educational flyers and do uh, slow traffic down and hand out these flyers to educate people on the history of that site. We started out with 1,500 pamphlets of information, and by 10 o'clock in the morning, we were out. It might have only been 50, 60 people, but at that time, it was a community right there by the bypass making sure that everybody knew we are here, we're not going away. And when we went and we met with Confederacy, um, a very wise man come and told us, the only way that you're gonna get this back is a reclamation, is an occupation. They won't listen any other way. There's nothing that we can do but use ladies can. Under the great law, it is our job, it is our duty to protect the lands for the next seven generations. What we had intended to do was um, try to come at it from a unified perspective. And we started meeting with the so-called factions of the community, um, the Mohawk workers, uh, band council, the confederacy, the, the traditional governance. Um, to try and get everybody to work together on this. How we got involved is um, with these, these girls, um, Don and, and uh, Janie, asked us uh, if we'd come to their meeting about, uh, you know, they're having this protest and what they thought uh, if we could 
you know, help support them. So I said to Ruby, what do you think we should do? And she was worried, you know, what are, what, what can we do? I said, we got to do something to help these girls. I just wrote on a piece of paper, peace, power, and righteousness. And I said to remember those three words and, and uh, have a good mind. We told them that it's got to be peaceful, not because uh, I think they wanted to really fight. <laughs> so we kind of calmed them down, so they kind of start listening. The first day that we went out, the construction workers weren't happy that we were there, but they let us go. And the second day, like Janie said, a uh, bulldozer went after her, bobcats come after us. We had a truck with um, stone dumped at our feet, and unless we didn't move, they were going to cover us. And this is their mentality. They will push and push and push and see how far they can go before you back down. They stopped the workmen from going into that site at all. So you went down there and talked to them and said that's not what the council signed on for, to physically stop somebody. And uh, we had a bit of a discussion there, so um, things stayed the way they were until next council, and we had to really think about it. And we decided that we had to support the people and that we had to um, get what we can out of this whole movement for, for our children. So we uh, remained very supportive of it, and the one stipulation we put on it that there, um, there can't be any violence. We went in on February 28th, and we took that over, and I'm telling you, it was scary. They didn't want to give up this time because they knew we were in there for good. I remember one night, um, it had, hadn't started snowing yet, but we were all sitting around the fire talking and laughing and doing what we do. Everybody started getting tired, so I went and I went to sleep in my car for a little while, and these boys were laying all around the fire and they promised to keep the fire going. Come back out, it had started snowing about two hours later. They were laying there with two inches of snow on them. Not a blanket. I knew that um, the women in our community are, are, are quite strong, but I have never seen uh, women as strong as the clan mothers are. We ran into all kinds of different things every day, and we were there, you know, quite a few hours every day. And uh, there was a lot of stress. A lot of people were getting, like, uh, tired out, and they needed someone to talk to. So most of the time we were in, uh, at least I was, uh, most of the time in the trailer. And that's where they would bring people in who needed to talk and who needed settling down and try and soothe their whatever it is that was bothering them. My clan mother, she, she's a people's person. Like, like she knows how to um, relate to, to us and that. And uh, she's really calm when she tells you things. And, and if you're doing something wrong, and she'll, she'll tell you and the right way, you know? And so she has a good mind and, that's, that's, uh, and, and she's very strong. And um, I know that they're kind of quiet sometimes, but um, when they speak, everybody listens, eh? And, and that's, that's called respect. When everybody else walked away from us, those women, every woman that was down there, are the ones that held us up. The OVP went and camped out on some political doorsteps for a while, and they actually managed to bring together representatives of the municipality, of the province, the OPP themselves, the uh, federal crown, the band council, and ourselves. And uh, they came forward with several proposals, and in the end, we told them, the Confederacy told them that uh, you can do what you want, but the only way through this is through the Confederacy. It's a gradual process. Uh, I see um, uh, more than half of the band council understanding that uh, we really need to get back to our own ways and our own form of government. And uh, that was shown specifically when the lead for negotiations was given to the Confederacy concerning the present land claims. In our language, in Cayuga language, it says, Sehog. So that's to help one another. And that's what we're doing. The Confederacy is standing up for the people. 
it was April 19th. We were in negotiations uh, from that afternoon till I think it was around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And there were very tense negotiations and they were on the verge of stalling. But in the end, we came forward and brought forward with a lot of ideals that could keep negotiations going where we could see our path clear of resolving this situation peacefully. And uh, in the background remained the uh, Ontario Provincial Police and uh, at that time their commander, uh, Maurice Pilon, uh, came into the room and he was very glad that we were able to continue with our negotiations and he looked forward to it getting someplace. Well, that was a sad thing because we had asked them for insurance that there wouldn't be any harm come to our people. So we went home and four hours later I get a phone call uh, asking people to go down there, another call saying that I shouldn't go down there. But that was the morning of the raid. There was three things in that come through April wash that the police told us. They'd never come in that night. They would give us an hour's notice in case any people want to leave, kids, whatever, for safety. And they would never come in as long as we were negotiating. Well, all three of them, they broke. 4.44 a.m. is when I got the call. And I was down there by 5 to 5. The police are here. The police are here. They had every single road into that site blocked. They were lined up shoulder to shoulder along the tracks. They beat us. They pepper sprayed us. They tasered us. Arrested us. I saw men and women being held down by five and six cops. One old man that come down there faithfully every day. I saw him laying on the ground with a police officer's knee in his neck, his pants around his ankles. They treated him like an animal. He couldn't breathe, his face was purple. Another young boy was attacked by five cops and tasered. Tasered once and he kept going. They tasered him again. He pulled him out and went after the cops. Said, what you got? What are you going to do to me now? And that's when they pulled their guns. And when I got there, I was pulling up and cars were turning away because the police were sending them away. He said, wait, where are you going? Where are you going? Don't go. And somebody got the brilliant idea to start the fire on the tracks that stopped that train from coming in. And then a few of us women with very big mouths start yelling at the police. Told them they're breaking their own laws. This is a public highway. You have to move. You can't stand here. And they moved. They moved off of those tracks. And when they did that is when we won. We pushed them back into the pines and opened up those roads so that our, could pe our people could get to us. Once those roads were open, there was nothing they could do. I have never seen our people that angry, where you see actually crowd of people pick up a van and just toss over the bridge like it was nothing. And within a couple of hours, we had a couple of thousand people down there, and we backed the police right out of there. Well, it was really amazing, actually, that our people were able to walk those police off of the land without any guns or force. It was just a matter of walking them off. And I knew there was something more to it that happened that day. And uh, a few months later, this um, police officer, who um, was an older guy, he came over to me and my family, and um, he said, are you from Six Nations? And I said, yeah. He said, I was there that morning. There was something happened that morning that none of us can explain. Although, we knew there was only about maybe 50 people there, 40, 50 people. He said, I saw thousands of people, your ancestors, dressed in your 
people's clothing, on horses, on foot, mad, walking towards us. And he said, and it wasn't just me, there was five other police from my division who were there who have had to take a leave of absence because of what happened, what they saw. And he said, and to, to this day, you cannot get me to go to Caledonia. You cannot get me. I told him, fire me. <laughs> if you want me to come and be a part of this, it's wrong. With us sending the police out like we did, I knew they would try to cut us off. Every other barricade there's been, they cut, it, cut the Indians off. They starved them out. Well, I said, we'll take the bypass block so they can't come in, get there. The six line's going to stay open. Then, for safety, I didn't know what the police's attitude was, OPP. We run them out, where they come going back to regroup, bring back five times as many. So we set the barricade up on Argyle. That was for safety for all our people. We had too many people there, old people, kids, everything. So that was our only recourse at the time. You come and got it. we got attacked once. There's about 20 vehicles, extended vans, and I'd say about eight to 10 police officers in each. And they're geared, they're ready. They got, they got their um, protective gear on and stuff. They was telling us, no, we're not coming back in, but you know, you're gonna let somebody slap you like that, then say, trust me. No, <laughs> you don't trust them. You know, it's still hard to trust them today. A lot of people that were there in our community had grudges against one another for this and that and 10 other things. And that, that day, they were all put aside. All them issues were put aside of who did what to who over the years. And everyone started to work together on how to do things and how to feed one another and how to put shelter in for one another. And it was very good to be a part of that. We are here to let those clan mothers know that under our great law, we are there behind them because that's what the job of the Rodisca Regete is. The attributes of nations, when you look at the Mohawks, the keepers of the Eastern Door, and the Senecas, the keepers of the Western Door, they had to have certain attributes for being doorkeepers, such as when I put it into modern stories, when somebody comes to your house and doesn't knock and just pushes the door open, you, ha you have to have someone there that's going to say, hold on, wait. And then you have the other nations within the inside of the house that have different attributes again for the inside. This is why it's designed for uh, the younger brothers and older brothers. And when you start to study it and dig further in, it's such a great design. For the most part, what's happening at the site is volunteering. Like me and Jesse, we put a lot into it. Um, but it's not only us. The community in the whole, you know, has put a lot into it. Think about the cook, huh? Ruby Montour. You know what? That woman didn't complain one bit. Every day, morning, she's there right till 11, 12 o'clock at night. You never know what you're capable of doing until a need arises. We didn't have a fridge. We didn't have a stove. We didn't have hydro. And, uh, and it was under really, really very difficult times. It was always that knowledge that we could be raided at any given time. We were never sure or when that was going to be. But we were making anywhere up to 150 sandwiches four or five times a day. And our community, mostly the Confederacy, they came in with trays and trays and trays of hot food. Three times a day they came. And uh, even on into the evening they would be bringing hot food. And uh, we were feeding 500, 700 people, and I don't know how we did it, but in that amount of time, some really good people came. So I just wanted to ask you, what you're doing down here? While I'm supporting my people. It's cool to see. Uh huh. Yes, as much as I can. And, you, and, and then I bring uh, my stuff down once in a while, and if it gets too cold, I go sit in the car. And uh, I hope everything works out good for our side, you know. Uh -huh. I'd like us to have this land. Yeah. I mean, money comes, money goes. But if we can keep the land, the land be here. And you, you've been down there helping. In what way have you been <clears throat> helping? 
Well, making pots of soup and stew and bread. I go sit with them at the campfire, you know. And, and what do they talk about at the campfire? Oh, different roles the um, people play, whether it's the chiefs, the hereditary chiefs, or clan mothers, the safety of the people. What if the police come in? What do we do if we're pepper sprayed? What do we do? That's why they had the handkerchiefs over their face. I'd never ever thought I'd witness anything that stressful for our people. themselves in the media as a peaceful group. I ask you, how peaceful is what we've seen and witnessed in the past two, three weeks? How many more millions of dollars are we prepared to sit back and watch our elected officials throw away because they lack the will to deal with the native land claims head on? Open the road, Mayor! I'm mad at the OPP. They're paid to do their job. We can't drive up the bloody highway. It's closed. That's what makes me so mad. My children need answers. And if they're not looking for me to get the right ones, then I think authorities should do it for them. There are laws in this land, and the people we pay should be upholding the law. Yeah. And if they can't do that, then they don't belong in that position. Push them back! Push them back! at this line over here. So, it was down. Everything yeah, was, everything was down. down. It was a couple of cars went through. And then the white people bought their own barricade. All I seen was the police, and, the, and I just, I felt it coming. I could, 
just see these spots coming out, and I close, tried to close my eyes fast, but I couldn't. And I got it on, and I turned my face, and I got it on the side, and some in my eyes, and on my ears, my ears are still open. And how many grandchildren do you have? I have uh, 13. Okay. One on the way. Okay. One on the way. Did they see this going? There's been a lot of conflicts with the people of Caledonia, a lot of misinformation out there. Um, they feel that, uh, that we're attacking them and that their fight is not with them. And that's been a hard message to get out there. 99% of the rallies I was there and uh, it was quite frightening and uh, really um, uh, disheartening to see the um, the people and how, the ignorance they have concerning what we're fighting for. I mean, that's the first time that I heard us natives being called every name in the book, every name you could think of. And they were young people. I never knew. I mean, you see it in movies, but until you're there living it, you, you don't think it's possible. I live in Caledonia, and uh, I've lived there for 38 years. Um, I was always very proud to live in Caledonia, call myself a lifer. I was walking to back from the site, uh, and I don't go back late, um, maybe 8.30 or 9.30, and uh, a van rode by me. They rolled the window down. I didn't think anything of it, and they threw a, a Tim Hortons cup at me. Caledonia, people think that's all we're here for is trouble. And they're the ones making all the trouble, you know. So it's not nice. It's just, we love it. We've been, they've been living with us for centuries in uh -huh. Caledonia, you know. And why they'd come up with that kind of stuff, I don't know. They're scared. You know, those people are scared because basically they've been lied to their whole life and now we're standing there telling them a truth that they've never heard and it scares them to think about their future and their past. What is the true history of their past? And so out of this fear and this hurt of being lied to, it makes them angry. It's looked at as the big bad native is coming to steal my home that I've got everything I invested in. They're not turning to their grandfathers and saying, hey, uh, is this true? Did, were you in charge of monies for these people? Did you exploit the trust that was placed in you? Yeah. They never really look at that. It must be really hard for the white people too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had good relationships with uh, the people in Caledonia. We felt free to shop and get our groceries and wherever we wanted to shop. And since people got nasty, we bypassed Caledonia. We go to Hagersville or Hamilton to do our shopping now. I think they're helping us fight our cause. If they go through that <clears throat> and they threaten the native people, the native people will go right to the blockade. Be calm. Don't fight back. And the guys just stand there. Don't fight. They call your names. Don't say anything back. That's the way they've been doing it. And, they, and it just bugs them when they want to fight back. I was involved in uh, Ganastado for these lived there for the better part of six months. Um, and then most recently down uh, Sterling Street. It was just another building on our back door again. And a lot of the developers that were there were, were involved in uh, Douglas Creek. Thought of it more of a slap in the face that they could move up the road and thought they could get away with it. I had a son, he's five. I got a daughter, six months old. We're at the forefront of why we're fighting. 
you know, of why we're at the struggle. We can talk about social problems, alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, mass suicide. We keep getting pressed aside as this broader genocide is pushed on us every day. And this forced assimilation is just, it's too much. If we don't stop, stand up now. And try and stop what, what we can now. You know, I, don't, I, I can't see my son or my grandkids going through all of the stuff that we've, we've been put through. OPP came in uh, to the riot squad again. And uh, I was tasered, tasered and tasered and arrested. And suffered broken ribs during the arrest. The police are targeting us left and right. As they're trying to get us out of there. I mean, they're trying to, to settle land claims through arrests. Uh, I got charged with robbery times two. Uh, Sterling Street, there's mischief, assaulting police. And a series of fail to appear from court. I spent uh, 43 days. Three, 43 days in custody. One time I was locked in my cell for about the better part of 24 hours. And with uh, my toilet backed up and uh, the water didn't work. I had no drinking water, nothing. Well, if you want to know what a, what a strip, being strip searched seven times is like, and um, you go into a you go into a little room with your cellmate after after uh, after they do a search, they search all the cells, tear all your stuff apart. And then uh, you get put in the shower where there's five guards standing. Uh, you st stand beside your cellmate. You drop your boxes to your feet. Lift your shirt up, bend over, grab your ankles. And you hold that position for about five seconds or so. Anywhere else in the world that's rape, at least. <laughs> you do that somebody on the street, you're sitting in the cell next to me. <laughs> And these are people where I wasn't convicted of anything. They don't care who we are. They don't care that we're a sovereign people. They don't care that we have our own laws. We are in their system, and that's where they want to keep us. We've always given Canada that proof that we are sovereign, independent people, and that we wish to stay that way, that we have our own constitution. 1983, I was in Ottawa to deliver that message, and it went to the Prime Minister's office, who acknowledged receipt of letter, but they never responded to us. It's not that we view Canada or Canadians as our enemies, because they're not. As the Haldeman says, we are allies. Just because we seek to assert our sovereignty doesn't make us enemies. I inducted the Queen of England into Six Nations Minor Lacrosse. We're standing shoulder to shoulder with other nations within the world. Even on a national basis with the Iroquois Nationals, it costs anywhere from about 100000 to maybe 250000 to participate at the world level. But we get there. In the school system, their policy was, um, don't touch it, it's not there. Like in different classrooms that I had, people were asking us questions. And um, I found that really interesting how, because before, like nobody seemed to care, it almost seemed like. But now that this happened, um, people were asking us what was going on. People had a lot of misinterpretations and of who we were as Haudenosaunee people. And a lot of them already made up their minds. And so when they were talking about it, they kind of, it, um, they were almost prejudiced in their, the way they were thinking because like it passed down from their parents and stuff. They were like, oh, you guys are, why are you guys acting like terrorists? And why are you guys like trying to take over our houses and stuff? The citizens of Caledonia would start to realize that they are on native land. And so the, the sooner they would realize that, I think we would, have, we would have a better understanding of each other's ways. I mean, we're not out to kick them out. That's, I think that's the farthest thing from our mind. But we would ask probably that they uh, maintain the purity in that area. Each of us today must commit and devote ourselves in whatever way we can to use the power of our human capacity for connectivity, to breathe life back into our Mother Earth who owns our bodies.
With the knowledge and awareness of global warming, the community took a stand once again, just as our ancestors have in the past, to reclaim green spaces here on the Haldeman Trap. Our intent was not to confine or restrict other people from where they have put their homes or to gain money and material wealth. Our true intention was to bring justice related to our land. Whatever keeps, sustains our life, that's what's in the middle of that dish. So it's our responsibility to protect that for the, oncom the unborn generations. Uh, the faces that are coming, they say, that means the coming faces from the ground. So our job is to protect that and ensure that it's there for them. So this is the law that our Creator has given us long before contact. This, this is what settled the territorial battles that were happening. Because of the uh, relationship of women as being the nurturers and the ones who bring life, bring creation, bring the Creator's spirit into this physical world, her role is the same as the, as our mother, the earth, as being the nurturers and the caregivers and provides us with life. And so as women, we're given that responsibility when we, when we bring those babies into this physical world. The most important thing in our lives is uh, the foods that we, which keep us alive. We follow the seasons as things get ripe. We have a ceremony to say thanks. We always start with uh, midwinter ceremonies, which is the start of our year. Most of our words there are for the coming season, that everything that the earth provides, she provides for us again. The next one is when the weather starts turning warmer. We thank all the trees, and we pray that the maple will give us the sap so that we can make it into syrup. And then after that, we have welcoming the thunders back. And that happens right after we hear the thunder for the first time that spring. And they are the ones that bring the rain. At one time, there were huge, scary animals that our Creator didn't make that roamed the earth. And when He made the people, He put them under the ground to stay there. And the ones that keep them there are the thunders. And then uh, we have two ceremonies. In the morning one is the sun ceremony. We thank the sun, whom we call our elder brother. And then when that ceremony is over, they start the moon ceremony this time. And we call it the moon, our grandmother. The next one would be the thanking the seeds or blessing the seeds. And then after that, about the middle of June, we have the ceremony for the strawberries because they are the main leaders of all the berries and then in July we have the new beans ceremony in late August we have our foods get together the small kind at that time we set the date for the big green corn later on in the fall we have our finished harvesting ceremony and then we have the great feast for those that have passed on that uh, pretty well completes the cycle. We still do those things. We're still connected to nature, and we still value the land. So you can't tell me that 200 years ago, when my ancestors were even more so dependent on the land, that they were trying to give it away? I said, that's a joke. That's ludicrous. We have to be very careful what we're leaving for our children to inherit. And it's not just about, it's not just because 
of what's owed to us as far as culture and land goes, that's enough. But the fact is, there's also another thing coming in here, which is a bigger picture. It's the environment. And as Native people, in our philosophies, we have a lot to offer there about the environment. And we could help them. We could help them with their own children, where they're going with all their development, to be more ecologically minded. What I see is a real disconnection to nature and a disconnection to to our environment, our mother, the earth, and and everything there that for thousands of years has taken care of us. I mean, and getting right back to here to the river, 12 years ago a study was done in Kitchener because they wanted to expand and develop. They had their own study, came back to, to the city hall and, and they were told not to go through it because the river was at its maximum capacity about the habitation it could support. No way, no way, shape or form can you get out of drinking water. Everybody has to have water. We're here to prevent the contaminated garbage going into this particular site. They haven't consulted with us at Six Nations about this concerning this. They don't have permission from us to do this at all. It's come through uh, our Confederacy Council, and every chief that was at Confederacy Council does not want uh, contaminated garbage coming in here. For us, it's a really happy, happy circumstance. It shows that we've got real common cause around environmental issues. We're really concerned about the environment. We're really concerned about the land. We're really concerned about uh, the impact on us, and in my case, my grandchildren. All I can say is I'm delighted to welcome our, to welcome our brothers and sisters from the Six Nations, because this, this is a joint struggle, and I think uh, an important opportunity to show these communities can work together really constructively around an issue that matters to us all. We can no longer drink water from our streams and rivers. Our children are not safe playing outside because of harmful chemicals sprayed in the air. Foreign entities are being introduced into our ecosystem, creating mass devastation amongst our trees and medicines. It's leading us into catastrophic consequences. And these storms that we're getting are, are very small compared to what we're going to experience if we don't stop on that road that the majority of people are choosing, which is disconnecting from the earth and not looking at those trees and those medicines as being important. They come to us about 10 years ago, a study out of the University of Guelph, and they show us a satellite picture and say, well, this is great. Did you know Six Nations is the only place that shows up in southern Ontario as a green area, as a place that actually has trees? And the ironic thing is they come and they tell us that, and what they don't realize is it's because of our lifestyle, and it's the way we've lived to this point. That's why the trees are still here, because we recognize their value. Yet they come here and they tell us, and by the way, We'll teach you how to manage that forest. Hello, who should be telling who how to manage forest? If our people have to use our treaties, and if we have to use our land leases to stop them from destroying all of the earth, then that's what we got to do. And if that means breaking laws they've made up so that they can continue to be wealthy and rich and rip up the land, um, so be it. If the people, if they are of native ancestry, be proud of who you are. Don't knuckle under to anything that is, you think is wrong. Everything you do should be right for the people of tomorrow, and the people of tomorrow is the children of today. After the um the Elder Summit in 2004, like I went, I went there, my dad made me <laughs> go there, and um, I went there and there was a lot of people from all over the place, a lot of youth there. I never like had that experience before having so many Indigenous people from all over the place there, just talking about the issues we have as youth. Being involved with the core youth that were getting everything prepared and um, getting the declaration ready, it just kind of almost like sparked something in me and I was just like, wow, this is really important. Youth have a right and responsibility to practice a traditional way of life. After that, the spirit of the youth group formed, and I was like, all, right away, I was like, yeah, I want to get involved with this. We started 
doing stuff to prepare for the Unity Run. We're going to present at the UN for this year's run. We're running through um, New York City and we're going to the UN and that's where we're going to present the declaration and saying this is what we made as Indigenous youth and this is what we want to be heard around the world. So uh, Indigenous Youth Declaration, Kindling the Fire. <clears throat> We, as Indigenous youth, have gathered on the Haudenosaunee territory for four years to share our achievements and future prospects on peace and unity. We are the seventh generation, and we accept the responsibility for the prosperity of the next seven generations and of our Mother Earth. Our ancestors looked to us to re-speak the words that once fell on deaf ears and to stand strong as one. Therefore, as our leaders have done before us, we as Indigenous youth unify in order to rise to the challenge of continuing to wipe the tears of all nations. It's up to the Crown now to deal with us now peacefully and using a good mind and find answers to the injustices that have been done to us in the past, which they acknowledge. They acknowledge that's been done. But although they acknowledge that's been done, they keep coming back at us with policies that won't work, that haven't worked in the past, and we have to keep reminding them. While they talk about their laws, we're talking about your policies that have not worked. Things haven't changed, and your laws have not protected Native people. When I look across the table at Chief McNaughton and Sub-Chief Hill. I'm, I, you know, I know I'm looking at, at not only my equals, but the leaders of a very significant community that has been important to the history of the Crown and the history of Canada. And we can't put the genie back in the bottle. We can't go back to the way things were. I say this also to the people of Haldeman County. You know, it isn't going to be like it was the day before the barricades went up. It isn't going to happen. We can't overcome our differences. We can't overcome the issues on the table if we have a true desire to. Even though we can overcome, we have to overcome within a time frame. I just don't know, like, where it's going to end or how it's going to end. And, and it's scary. It's scary for everybody. They want us to be afraid. They want us to run home and, and, and go to bed, you know, and cover up, you know. That's not going to happen. And uh, they need to know that there's a lot of people that are willing to put their lives on the line for this. Because it's for the future of our children, you know. It's not really about us. It was worth every bit. 43 days in jail. Worth every bit. It took a long time for Six Nations to stand the way we're standing now. All these other communities are looking to us for hope, and if we can't get together and fix this, then what hope is there left, you know? The women are, are reclaiming um, their voice and addressing the oppression. And I see it happening not only in our own community, but I see it happening across the world in many indigenous communities. As Haudenosaunee people, we need all the skills of all our people so that we can win these negotiations, get our lands back, do what we need to do to look after our environment, our culture. They promised that as long as the grass shall grow, the sun shines, and the rivers flow, and this is what we believe in strongly. And uh, that's what I keep thinking that now we're there, we're using all that against him now. And, and I'm hoping and asking the Creator to help us that He will not do give us any more, push us any more. This is it. We've had it. Thank you. And then it will happen that children will be born in those times. And when they look in their direction, they will say to themselves, look how burdened they are. Let us go help them. And then they're gonna come running, many of them. And then they're gonna put their shoulders underneath that tree. And they're gonna start to uplift that tree again. 
The, the following statements call for immediate action. Our collective minds and hearts hereby declare the following a living document. We as indigenous youth of Turtle Island demand that each and every one of our treaties to be honored. We as indigenous youth on Turtle Island demand that discrimination against indigenous peoples not be tolerated. We demand that all government policies, acts, and laws which discriminate against indigenous peoples be abolished immediately. We as indigenous youth of Turtle Island refuse to subject to any form of colonization. We refuse to allow all previous effects of colonizations to pass on to the next seven generations. All hate, resentment, and anguish ends now. Youth have a right and responsibility to practice a traditional way of life, whereas guardians, we implore ourselves to take action to protect, preserve, and restore Mother Earth and all creation, and to free our people from hindrance and prosecution. And when this happens, it will bring peace again. But it will be for the last time. I sing my father's song. enough is enough and that we're going to stand our ground No 
nobody in, in Canada is accustomed to having to deal with what, what this community has been put through. We're not going away. We didn't die out. We don't know how far tensions will rise. We look to our government to help us and they're not doing anything. They left us to hang out and dry here. Ain't nothing gonna drag me off of here, except maybe a bullet between the eyes, and that's the only way you're gonna get me off of this land. My name is Doreen Silversmith of the Lower Cuga Nation, and I'm of the Duistuis or Kildare Clan. My name's Ken Hewitt, and I am a spokesperson of the Caledonia Citizens Alliance. My name's Don Martin Hill. I'm a Mohawk from Six Nations. I live at Six Nations and have lived here since I was 18 years old. My name is Joseph Zamuto, and my family and I live in Caledonia, and we reside backing on to the Douglas Creek Estates. It blows my mind that in 2006, I'm still dealing with a group of people who do not understand internationally and globally that we have been acknowledged as the heirs and the owners of these lands unless the Crown enters into agreements with us. Um, they have so not learned anything about our history. It's not as if we just suddenly one day sprung up on the land and said, hey, we're taking this over now. So, you know, it's been going, it's, it's been going on a long time through courts and uh, uh, courts has been um, stalling and playing games with us and um, wouldn't sit down with us. And we've written letters and everything and went through the courts and um, the government just keeps putting it off and off, you know, so enough is enough. Simply stated, we, we can't move. We can't leave this, this community if we wanted to. We can't sell this home. Most people in this neighborhood cannot sell their home. Real estate sales were at all-time highs. Building was, uh, construction was going on, and, and uh, we just finished uh, an area on one side of Caledonia where it was completed in record time. Uh, this was to be a new construction development that uh, looked to be just as promising. Uh, Caledonia has been a, a very, very fast-growing community, one of the fastest in the country for its size, and uh, that's all come to a halt. What has changed in the community between Six Nations and uh, Caledonia is that um, the racism is more overt, like it's more out in the open, and it's very blatant, and whereas before it was uh, more or less hidden. Every single one of them. This is our tribe. Yeah, this, this is our, our this white is our tribe. tribe. Yeah. White tribe. What power. <laughs> I've seen people comment from either side, comment on how uh, we're the lesser, um, the lesser breed, if you want to call it that, the lesser. Um, um, life form, as silly as that sounds. We're superior, they're superior, back and forth. The one memory I have was there was five or six fair-haired ladies on the lawn screaming, you effing Indians, you know, you lazy so-and-sos, get the F off our land and out of our way. It's a terrorist attack, that's what it is. We're all being held hostage here. Yeah. Yep. Like, get real, you know, and go scream at the government and go scream at your mayor and go scream at the Henkos for, you know, doing this behind your backs and letting Caledonia pay the price for it. Like, go scream at the appropriate people. We here, on the other hand, have been victimized. As Caledonians, we feel that we have had our lives disrupted, our businesses and our homes devalued, our freedoms to move about are limited by the actions of this group of protesters. In this particular case here with the Native community, 
there's 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 I'm sure animosity from from Canadians uh, living locally who see the native community in, in benefiting from different tax advantages, whether they see the whole picture or understand the whole picture is academic. It's what they see, and perception is always reality. It was an explosive scene last night when hundreds of residents who had gathered for a rally made their way to the barricade, demanding police let them through. One man was arrested. Adding to the fire this morning, Caledonia's mayor made these comments on CBC's morning program about some residents' apparent inability to get to work. Their homes. They don't have a, uh, monies coming in automatically every, every month. They've got to work to survive, and, and the natives have got to realize that. Late this afternoon, an official apology from the town council and a promise the mayor will no longer be the town's official spokesperson. Even the kids now have caught on and a lot of it is in, the negative, in a negative light. Um, we don't want to see our little girl grow up that way. I finally broke down in a sense and, and typed out a letter, an email to Prime Minister Harper. I told him that we are here and he needs to see that. I told him that we are wondering when he will get involved, wondering when he will actually step in and see what is going on. Uh, <laughs> whose baby is this, yours? My kids um, for a long time were afraid of white people, terrified actually. Um, and I had to do a lot of, um, I had to sit them down and have this discussion that these people that are screaming these terrible things at us are not all people and that that there are really good people of all colors. It's a long-term uh, impact with respect to the social fabrics. Uh, it, it affects them socially. It, it, uh, it, it makes them view the natives at a different level. It makes the natives view Caledonia at a different level. And, uh, and we, have to, we have to get rid of that poison to be able to move forward and, and discuss more concretely where we could be 10 years from now, five years, 20 years. Other First Nations people are looking up to us and they're waiting to see what happens here, um, to see the end result of what will happen here. And I really believe that um, we will not fail them and that we will come to a just, peaceful resolution to this and that um, they are looking up to us, I know that. For Caledonia and surrounding areas, I ask the people occupying the land to go home to their families, communities, and let the negotiators work out a solution. Many of the residents, including our family, know that the occupiers have a message point to make, yet the manner in which it has been put forth has put a strain on the community. Put your efforts in protest towards government sites or offices. For Canada, the federal government needs to put this on top of their agenda. They should have stepped in from the moment this began. 
while it sounds really conciliatory and he makes a point that the government has been inept, um, I think to tell us that's a solution to go home is insulting. That is our home. And I wish he understood that and I wish that he um, would understand this is our homeland. And if he only understood what little bit of land we have left here, we're more than likely willing to die for. It's not about a land claim, it's about land restitution and giving back what was illegally taken. I think, I think that we need to get away from Indian Act processes that have bound us to certain ideas around Indigenous people and create a new avenue for these claims to be heard in an expedient manner. I think that they have st to stop demanding that we extinguish our Aboriginal title in order to receive a comprehensive land claim. Why would you extinguish yourself to get what's rightfully yours? We've had a lot of patience over 200 years and I think part of the solution is recognizing that patience is running out. We need to do something, we need to do it now, and if we don't, I would suggest that the outcome for everyone are going to be abysmal. She certainly has uh, some valid points. The government, which I've said along, has to step in and, and do more. Um, people need to realize um, the importance of these treaties. We're people. We're uh, sharing the same community. We need to live our lives, and um, we deserve, you know, what we've worked for, what we have, what we've lived for. The Crown has to recognize us as the allies that we were and step in and negotiate on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. They have to stop calling us Indians. We're not Indians. Indians are from India. We are Ogwe, Howe people, the real people of the land. The Indian Act has to, to go because it is utterly racist. The returning of our land would be a great step for us. Once they hand that over to us, it would be a great victory for us. Some of us are getting older now and probably it will be one of our last fights. And that is what I want to see in my lifetime to see the land return back to us for future generations. It's, it's, it's frustrating because, because we don't, we do not downplay where they're coming from in terms of their claims and the frustration they have dealing with the governments. We're seeing that firsthand now. We, we, we totally respect and understand that. There's no win in this any longer. You can't win uh, from either side, locally anymore. You know, there's, there's a level of respect that, that, uh, that exists, and, and that is what has to be focused on. The land, the money, none of that means anything to, to the community here in Caledonia. And unfortunately, if it means everything to, to the people of Six Nations, it, it still will have a, a dramatic effect on, on the respect here locally. And it's, it's, it's the respect that, uh, that has been damaged from, from taking the stand that they did and not recognizing that, that the community here has hurt and has been hurting. And, and while we respect that they have suffered for many, many years, we also have to find ways to work together. And, and we just haven't been able to come to that, to that grip. The occupation is more of a short-term issue that needs to be addressed for the benefit of both communities, allowing them to focus on re-establishing relationships. This can only be done through the federal government recognizing the urgency behind all land claims nationally. Once committed by the federal government, the natives then can be reassured that the need to occupy the site is gone. The site then can be beautified with trees and grasses while the longer-term issues are resolved, title, and use. In the solutions, he said, occupation of Douglas Creeks. It's not an occupation, you know. Um, it's a land reclamation, so get that clear. Basically, he's almost there, like he, he's kind of like seeing what we're seeing, and that, um, that we should be get it together and to, um, you know, uh, go after the government and not each other. And so I believe that he's um, almost there, 
and uh, that's a good idea. And um, you know, sometimes because it's really difficult, sometimes um, you know, like I just want to grab these people, like you know, the government and whoever the authorities who are oppressing us, and just grab them and shake them up, and and um, you know, like what is it they they can't see, you know, like and sometimes I just wish that they could walk down the streets of our soul and without throwing their garbage and deceit and um, really see how we view the world as a whole and that um, to see our suffering and where we're coming from as Ongohome people. Beverly, what needs to be understood about what's happening at the 1492 Land Back Lane Camp? Uh, well, what needs to be understood is that this is a this is a historical land claim um, going back uh, a couple of hundred years that has not been addressed. Um, there's a, a process that uh, was uh, that didn't work with uh, Caledonia. So negotiations had already begun at that time, and they failed because Canada couldn't produce uh, title to the property, not only in Caledonia at, uh, at the Douglas Estates, and uh, it's also happening here. So that's, that's a rare, very historical um, concepts, very historical information that the public needs to know, and it would take uh, probably a, a whole few hours to describe the uh, the historical piece itself. Well, well let's go to uh, injunctions. More recently, uh, less historic, more recent injunctions were granted on August 7th. What can you tell us about those? So I know that, uh, you know, any court and anybody can go in and get an injunction and, you know, lawyers can go in and and obtain the information and they have a limited amount of information uh, when they go to court uh, they don't have the full story so the judges are getting information from lawyers that uh, that don't also don't know the history that also haven't done have they done the uh, the title to the territory have they have they looked at all of the uh, the land claims and the the history again it goes right back I'll go keep going back to the land claims process, the history, uh, we never gave up title to those lands and territories and in fact Canada owes us money for those lands and resources. What's next for you guys from is a Canada. legal perspective? Um, actually I don't know, I'm not, I'm not legal counsel, uh, I'm a community member, I'm from Six Nations, I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor, now associate dean at the Windsor Law School. I have supports from from around the world, um, and so my uh, my connection with with all of the young people who are at the site, um, I know them since they were babies. Um, they were there at the site in Caledonia in 2006, so I 100% support them uh, and know that what they're doing is according to Haudenosaunee law and being land protectors. They're following our rule of law. Well, Beverly, thanks for taking the time to share this, uh, this updated uh, situation with us. You take care. Yes, thanks a lot.
As a member of parliament, I felt it a responsibility to go beyond the empty words of reconciliation and land acknowledgements. So when I was invited to hear from um, the peaceful land defenders of this area, of this territory, I thought it was a responsibility that I had as a member of, of parliament to hear directly from the, the people who are uh, claiming, reclaiming this territory to be able to go back into the House of Commons with a better understanding of the issues, uh, not just that affect this community here, but I think that Indigenous people are facing across the country. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, question: uh, what, do, what did you what did you have to say to them, to the people here today? It wasn't so much of having something to say as it was to listen, and I think what I what I observed here clearly was a, a peaceful encampment uh, of women and elders and land defenders who are carrying out their rights as Haudenosaunee people in these territories, living their laws in a peaceful way, honoring the, the two-row wampum belt, understanding that we are in different canoes. And that when you have governments that cross over, they're going to get the kind of uh, resistance in the defense of these lands. Um, these lands are irreplaceable to these communities. And we've witnessed it going back to 2006, uh, going back to you know, 1906 and, and beyond that. And I think what is clear is that the use of police as an extension of civil, uh, you know, land claims or land rights is perpetrating and continuing to perpetrate violence against Indigenous people, uh, rubber bullets, any type of um, violence that is used is not going to come to an agreement. We've seen it in Wet'suwet'en, we're seeing it here today. We're on the eve of 25 years in Ipperwash. These are not new lessons to learn. Uh, so I would like to see that these injunctions stop targeting peaceful protesters, uh, peaceful land defenders who are uh, just carrying out their rights as Haudenosaunee people. Mm -hmm. What did you hear from them? Like what was the, the biggest, uh, I guess, concern or what, what did you hear that you, know, you thought uh, was very important? that uh, you need to bring, maybe bring back? It is the understanding that the use of injunctions to criminalize and target individual people, to put onus on individuals when the treaty rights are with the collective. Nation to nation is a language that the federal government uses, but clearly is not being honored in these situations or scenarios. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you get back to the office, what are you going to do? Well, my intention today is to listen. I have. A series of meetings, I've been in multiple phone calls. Uh, it is to listen to all parties and all sides and come up with a, you know, a, a clear and better understanding. Certainly there is nobody more expert in the experience than those that are living it. And that is apparent here on these territories. It's always been apparent. And so you know, I think the two most obvious things are to de-escalate any potential for violence. I would never want to see anybody hurt over, you know, property rights. I would never want to see the federal government use violence to displace Indigenous people. Um, so, you know, the removal of injunctions is the first thing to stop criminalizing people for these claims that have been in court for, for 27 years and, again, going back to the, to the two rural wampums. And secondly, that the federal government has a responsibility and a duty to come back to the table. This is the responsibility of the federal government. This is a result of the failure of this federal government and federal governments prior to act on outstanding land claims. This has been in court for 27 years. The fact that there was even processes in place that would allow a development to begin in the situation where this is already in court speaks to the level of disregard they actually have for those processes. Mm -hmm. What do you think the, uh, the current government can, can do? The current government can get back to the table with land claims. The current government can, can act to remove the, the individual targeting of people through injunctions, the criminalization of Haudenosaunee people and, and First Nations people across these territories. Uh, their rights are inherent rights. There are not rights that are granted nor taken away by any type of level of government. These go, you know, through the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. These are not just words. These are international laws and agreements. The Two World Wampum is a long-standing treaty that is law, and that a 
a judge deciding on an injunction is the absolute inappropriate place for for land claims to be settled. And I think if this government is acting in good faith and a good mind, that they will take that notice and understand that this is not going to go away, that uh, not just Haudenosaunee, I would say from Wet'suwet'en to Mi'kmaq territories across the country, up to, to, to Nunavut and, and Inuk and Inuit uh, peoples, that they are going to continue to, to live in their traditional ways, as was accorded by the original agreement. So if you, if I guess NPP was in charge, would you be able to say, remove the police and what would you do? do would that be possible? What would you do? Uh, well, I think that the, if the federal government has the ability to operate in good faith with land claims, they will deal with land claims. The police are a symptom of, not the, like the cause. Right? The police are here under a provincial jurisdiction when the language of the federal government has always been nation to nation. So if this federal government, who used the language of reconciliation in 2015 to become elected under this Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, if he means what he says about reconciliation, if he means what he says about nation to nation, then he will, he will treat these processes with the due respect that he would treat nation to nation negotiations. today in support of the land defenders at 1492 Landback Lane. The Haudenosaunee have lived for thousands of years in the area known today as the Haldeman Tract, and a treaty with the British Crown in 1784 guarantees their entitlement to this land. However, in what has become a familiar story in Ontario, their rights have not been recognized and they now face the prospect of forcible removal from their land. The Haudenosaunee have been waiting for justice for far too long. They have seen the federal and provincial governments continue to pass the buck, refusing to listen to community while their land is being stolen for unwanted development. They have spent decades in the courts to no avail. Now Premier Ford has abdicated his responsibilities, leaving the OPP to enforce the will of the developers. Police enforcement of a unilateral decision is not a sign of nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Of what use are land acknowledgements if Indigenous people continue to be forcibly removed from the land that is demonstrably theirs? The critical work of reconciliation cannot occur without respecting Indigenous sovereignty, and that work must start now. I echo the land defenders at 1492 Landback Lane, as well as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council and the Six Nations Elected Council in their call for a moratorium on development to allow for a thorough and respectful nation-to-nation -nation negotiation. Thank you. Seko sawa kweko, wana tabatala nota ne ohanga kali wahtekwa kalana. Kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le. Te yatinu wala to sne on kwesum a. Te yatinu wala tu sye ke nista honcha. Te yatinu wala tu sne one ka sum a. 
Tony do hak ne guani con la guayo yana le 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 te etino wala dos ne gacho sum a te etino wala dos ne kahi sum a te etino wala dos ne ohende sum a tunia do hak ne guani kola kwayo yana le kwayo yana le Quayo yana le, 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 quayo yana le. De etinum wala dos ne, oggi no asum a. De etinum wala dos ne, onu qua sum a. Te etino wala dos ne o de la sum a tenia do hak ne guani con la qua yo yana le 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 Quayo yana le, quayo yana le. De etino wala dos ne gaya tosela. De etino wala dos ne condilio. De etino wala dos ne oguile sum a. Tunia do hak ne aguani con la. Quayo yana le, 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 quayo yana le. Te etino wala dos ne oggi da ukum a. Te etino wala dos ne la di welas. Te etino wala dos ne gaeli ne kawe lage. Tunia do hak ne guani kum la. Kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le. Qua yo yana le, 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 qua yo yana le. Sun qua chi a gyo kane ka ga la a qua, e ti so ta a so ta ne ka ga la a qua. Te etino wala dos ne o chista no kwa sum a. Tunia do hak ne a guani kum la. Kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le. Kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le. Kwa yo yana le, kwa yo yana le. Qua yo yana le, qua yo yana le. De etino wala dos ne kaeli ne o kweta ge. Danchi de nu wala dos ne sanguaya dizum. Qua chi o yana le ana ho da lo san. Tanya do hak ne gwa ni kum la. Quayo yana le, quayo yana le, 
Choir.